Hey there, podcast explorers. Welcome to Pit Chat, the podcast where we gather around, toss in some hot topics, and let the flames of conversation burn bright. I'm Michelle. And I'm Wayne. And together, we're your hosts on this journey through the sizzling landscape of current events, sprinkled with a dash of mystery, a pinch of the unexplained, and a whole lot of fun. That's right, Michelle. We're not just here to talk about the everyday stuff. We're diving deep into the realms of the unknown, exploring UFO sightings, unraveling paranormal mysteries, and maybe even roasting a marshmallow or two along the way. So whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join us as we stoke the flames of curiosity and bring you the hottest takes on the coolest conspiracies. It's like sitting around a fire pit with your friends, but with a bit of extraterrestrial excitement. Each episode, we'll be serving up a blend of the latest headlines, intriguing stories, and a touch of the supernatural. From politics to pop culture, and from ghosts to government secrets, we've got it all covered. And hey, if you've ever looked up at the night sky and wondered what's out there, or if you've ever felt a chill down your spine in a supposedly haunted place, you're in the right spot. So, grab a seat, cozy up by the fire, and let's spark some conversation. This is Pit Chat, where the ordinary meets the extraordinary. Get ready for a wild ride down the rabbit hole. On an escalator. Okay, greetings everyone. How is it going out there? And thank you for joining us tonight on a very special edition of Pit Chat. I got Michelle sitting over here. I am here tonight, but you guys get my icon. I'm the official cat wrangler tonight. Yeah, the cats are (laughs) getting ready to get all fired up and try to take over the show yet again. And uh, Michelle just doesn't have her camera working right tonight, so we're just not even going to bother using it. So Yeah, we got a special treat for you guys tonight. So we're doing a little something different. Uh, We have a author joining us who's a sci-fi author and former military uh, personnel. So um, specifically the Navy, and we're going to be talking to him. His name is Christopher Lorick, and he spent 28 years in the Navy, and we're going to be bringing him on here in just a minute. So just wanted to remind everybody that if you wanted to help support the podcast, you can join by clicking that join button and pay a little membership fee uh, each month and get some special icons. You can send PayPal, you can do super chats, whatever you want to do. Every little bit helps support the channel. And also, uh, as a special note, if you go into the show description underneath the video here, you will find a link to Christopher's book on Amazon. So you can go ahead and order that and check that out. So Michelle, I think without any further ado, we should go ahead and bring Christopher on. Absolutely. All right. And Christopher, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So one of the first things we like to do is have people in their own words, talk about their history a little bit. And I would like you to explain to our watchers and our current listeners a little bit about your background and why you decided to go into the military and specifically the Navy. Uh, Let's see. I was hatched uh, in Oklahoma where I'm born and always had this desire for service of some kind. And, Military was actually one of them. Uh, Have a family history of military service members. Uh, I wanted to emulate that. And when I looked at the different services, uh, Air Force didn't sound right to me. The Marines didn't sound right. And the Navy seemed like it was more mobile around the world. 
And I found out that I could interact with the other services and with the Marine Corps. I kind of put them in a special place since I served with them twice and employed twice with them. But yeah, the Navy just sounded like a better fit for me than the other services. And, and I was just going to ask you, what was your, uh, I don't want to say MOS, your military occupational specialty kind of stuff, but what was some of your main jobs that you did, your main duties? Well, the title that I finally qualified for is Plans, Operations, and Medical Intelligence. It's a subset community and medical administration. It's the operational arm, as I like to call it, of medicine. Yes, doctors go out operational and other things, but our particular uh, skill set, we call it NOBC, or, de or my designator was 2300. My NOBC was 1805 Pommie. But we did all the military planning with every other military planner, and we had to know as much about military planning as the line officers. And a lot of times in the Navy, our cut was above our equal pay grade because we were trained specifically in that. And then we also help commander, uh, commanders with operations. We would monitor them, make adjustments. And if you were good enough, and I, I would pat myself on my back on this one because I listened to my mentors and I learned from the Marines and the Marine planning process, as well as the military operational planning process. Uh, I could do planning other than just my specific set. And then I can monitor and advise uh, the commanders and other staff members what we needed with the boots on the ground. Yeah. Important job, even though you're not on the front line, if you're not there listening to the front line and mm -hmm. getting them the resources they need, they may end up in mission failure or even death. Yeah. We took that very seriously. <laughs> yeah, you, your, uh, your position was one of those where if you didn't do your job right, people could easily die. <laughs> you know, I, I always get like questioned by my students like why do we got to learn this why why do you take it so seriously it's not like anybody's gonna die well <laughs> <laughs> okay fine you're a ninth grader okay yeah you're learning earth science yeah you never know when somebody you know something might actually save your life by learning you know earthquakes tornadoes and volcanoes and dealing with that stuff but in your job it was like definitely somebody could possibly die if you didn't get it right Right, and you uh, just mentioned climate, weather, uh, terrain. We have to know about that. And one of the areas I was planning, the terrain actually would change as we were going through the movement of forces uh, moving to contact the enemy. Our terrain literally changed uh, drastically even and we had to make adjustments for that. And my job was to think ahead of that. The guys are on the ground dealing with what they're doing. I'm saying they're thinking, what's their next move? They're uh, two, three moves ahead of them. And what do we need to do to prep them and get them what they need in order to move into that new terrain? So yeah, uh, for the student, that you're talking about, you really do need to understand the trains, the environments, the ecosystems. Because if you don't, if you don't get that now, you're going to have to play catch up in, when you're an adult. And who knows? I mean, firefighters run into it all the time. Yeah. Uh, especially the forest fighters. <laughs> so. Sure. Um, well, one of the things that, that I'm, interested in and this this isn't in the sci-fi category and uh i was talking with michelle about this a little bit um when it comes to like leadership and recruitment of young people because you know you're calling for there needs to be more people to join space force and we can get to that in a little bit 
But what do you think about that recent article um, from Mission Readiness that says 77% of American youth can't qualify for military service? And that's from ages 17 to 24 year olds that would be disqualified based on obesity, mental health, uh, drug and alcohol problems, and things like that. What's your your take on that? Oh, I- <laughs> I'm trying to be polite here and not go say it's like, where do you start? (laughs) Well, yeah. I mean, Michelle has heard me go off and say very colorful words about this kind of stuff. And for me, I just look at it as a failure of leadership of this country and not wanting to provide the security that they are tasked to do, especially now. I don't know what I I kind of, Oh, yes. Um, It's not good for the, our Republic to have people who cannot step into the sciences or the military or state diplomacy or be able to do the underpinning of economy for the Republic. If we don't get our people to say, hey, well, famous man, President John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what can you do for your country? Mm-hmm. We seem to have taken his reverse and say, well, what can I get? And sadly, we no longer have physical education uh, in our schools. Uh, that was deemed inappropriate. And yeah, there were, I would say, mistakes made, obviously. But how do you get people outside? How do you get them to actually uh, participate in an exercise regimen? How do you teach them what to eat and not eat? I'm not even sure we teach home economics anymore in school. Not at my school. No. And that, um, the, the classes, the, the college graduates that are coming out of universities in Michigan has declined greatly for the home economic science. Um, in fact, I, I know for a fact that it was a big thing for years in the middle schools in the district that I teach in, and we now have none. Right. And I had to take in, I mean, I developed some skills that actually translated to the military as well. Yep. Uh, I was, uh, well, I was a Boy Scout, but I was also taught first aid, CPR in school. I was taught how to manage a home, not only by my parents, but in the school. Picked up some very good skills from both places. Plus, we had to definitely do math. We had to have literature. Uh, we, I mean, mm-hmm. broad scope. We had to go to chemistry, which I hated. Physics, I liked. <laughs> <laughs> Trig was way outside of my realm. That's why I was not an artillery officer. (laughs) Because if you can't do trigonometry, don't get behind a howitzer. (laughs) Yes. Well, in chemistry is just an advanced math class. So there is all that. (laughs) But those are skills that uh, help to improve our self-esteem because you learn, you get challenged, you have to overcome that. And uh, just running learning how to run properly because we don't even teach proper running skills. And in the Navy, I only had to sustain uh, a mile and a half for a certain amount of time. I had to meet a time goal. Yep. Marines, uh, three miles, Army is two miles. And yep. you'll, everybody has run it in a certain amount of time. Well, you have to learn how to run, how to breathe, you know, how to pace yourself. And we don't even teach that to the young people. And if we get away from service to country, service to others, we lose those skills. We lo- we lose that desire to actually help anybody. Yeah. And I do find it discouraging, but by the same token, um, we as a human race seem to get to a point where we will say enough and we turn around. The question is, will we get there to save our republic? Yeah, will it be too late? <laughs> right. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, uh, one of our listeners right now that's uh, watching uh, just put this up. He says, isn't all, isn't all planned to weaken the future citizens? No shop, no, f- no physical. And so no shop like wood shop and things like that. Uh, no physical education, no civics. California calls math bad. It's nuts. And, you know, from, from being a high school teacher myself, it's, and Michelle's a 23 year veteran of middle schools here in Michigan. I can honestly say that it really seems like it's more about treating the students as a customer and not wanting to hurt their feelings instead of trying to get them to actually learn skills that will be relatable and transferable into adulthood. And even if you don't use trigonometry, just the fact that you could get a sense of accomplishment and maybe a sense of pride, if you're good at it, it's just like why we made our beds every morning. You know, it was our first success of the day. Well, didn't they say that one plus one equals three? (laughs) I think that backs up means comment. Well, Well, yeah. And another thing, you know, I can think of with, with my job, there was a stint in time for about two years. They paid thousands to bring someone in to teach us about customer service. Yeah. Yeah. It's sad. Uh, At one point I was looking at uh, trying to go to the Naval Academy to be in a support role or instructor. And uh, a senior chief of mine uh, that I worked with at us Africa command, he went there uh, as an independent duty corpsman to assist and so forth. And he wrote me and said, sir, don't, no, don't come here. You, you'll hate it because the students are in charge, not the instructors. And that's backwards when uh, we do want you to think, and there's a time to think and question, but when you're under fire, you don't question, you obey, you load the guns and fire the guns, or you uh, go, well, Marines, you get into a kill box, Marines don't sit there, they charge their way out of it. Right. And they have to be trained to do that. Uh, You have to overcome a a mental resistance to duck. You have to get out of that kill box and attack the enemy. Uh, Break the ambush, in other words. Yeah. Improvise, and adapt, and overcome. Mental, yeah, and you have to have the mental resilience to do that. Um, yeah, I, I do wonder why you would not want a strong, resilient population. And a lot of that seems to go to when you're in power, you want to stay in power. And you want to craft those who will help you stay in power to do whatever you say. Yep. So they always keep you there. Uh, I think one of the mistakes and very few, uh, I, I think the founding fathers who wrote our constitution got it almost right. And, you know, they knew they didn't get everything right, but term limits uh, on Congress. And when I say Congress, I mean both houses of Congress the Senate and the representatives. Yep. They should have put a term limit on them and on the president from the get go. You know, yeah. George Washington did it by precedence. And uh, finally we passed an amendment to do that, but you have to go below Congress and to all the staffers. And in my mind, if a, when the Senate or a representative leaves their office, all those staffers have to leave and can never return to Congress. Yes, yeah. they're they're uh, they're really the real power that's sitting there in Congress are those staffers. And yeah, the ones that don't have any terms unless they get fired by somebody who comes in above them. Yeah, right. And that's the thing that in school, um, I'm not even sure if you teach civics anymore in the school system. Uh, my school does. They have a, a one-year class, and well, they combined it with world history and, civ- and civics. So, yeah, you know. world. I I love history. I like government, and I like the theories of government. 
but you you can only use history as examples but you really have to separate them because people need to learn what is the difference between a republic and a democracy right fascism communism oligarchies dictators tyrants and where they came from and what that really meant and what what does bureaucracy mean and what's the right size of a bureaucracy I think when they changed the structure of the schooling, um, like here in Michigan, you'll find Mm -hmm. a lot of K-5 buildings and then middle school picks up with 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Mm -hmm. High schoolers start in 9th grade. I found the government and civics classes in 9th grade when it was junior high, when it was 7th, 8th, and ninth grade. And then your history classes wouldn't pick up until you were in 10th, 11th, and 12th. So... I wonder if it's, I don't know. Get them while they're younger and they easily forget the importance of it, Pop. you know, possibly. I mean, if you want to sound like a big conspiracy person who is saying, you know, our government and the way we do things has been infiltrated by a bad actor who wants us all to be weak and like uh, the movie Idiocracy eventually, so... It's like I get into these conversations with people at work and I I listen to them talk about, oh, Trump, this Biden, that Republicans, this Democrats, that all this stuff. And it's like, I want to shake them and go, you're, you're making it sound like it's U of M versus Navy or something, or, or like a, a sports thing going on or tribalism at its best. I said, could you imagine what this country would be like if we had a one party system? That's the CCP. I mean, you want these people arguing and fussing with each other because you don't want them looking at you and what we're trying to do, you know? And I, I just, I get frustrated when it comes to talking to people like that and and they just want to win. They just want to win the argument. Right. Uh, it's more about, and again, I think that's what we've seen since maybe the 90s, more so than even in the 80s. Yep. Uh, we've turned, uh, I think, the education system to a point where you have to be right, even though you're wrong. Right. When the argument, even if that means shouting down the other person and not listening to them. Uh, and when I look at the framers of the Constitution, nowhere in the Constitution does say two party system. Correct. And what it really said is a representative will represent a district of people in what they desire. And two people will represent the state and what the state desires. Now, what's the state? State legislators, the state governor, what they desire. And they go to D.C. and represent that, not a party, be it Republican, Democratic, Democrat, Socialism, Independent, or whatever. And ever since... We framed it, and the Federalist Papers came out. We started falling into camps. People yep. do that, and that's yep. uh, one thing with, I think, when you read SESG Explorer, you'll see that flavor of camps. And what does the Admiral have to do to overcome that? And thankfully, the way I wrote it, uh, the mission is so exciting that he doesn't really have to deal with the camps so much. But in chapter one and chapter two, you get that camp sensation. You know, right off the bat, uh, they've had to relieve a commander. And I was just going to say, yeah. And uh, one or two of the general officers were really going after the other two why do you want this particular guy? You know, (laughs) and they got a little nasty yet with each other, even though general officers are pretty polite and kid gloves with each other. So in that realm, they got a little nasty, but you know, 
the president picked him. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, good thing you brought that up because the next thing on my list was what prompted you to become a sci-fi writer, specifically something like, like uh, SESG Explorer. Um, wow. So way back in the day, uh, soon after uh, I was, I guess, uh, elementary school, uh, my dad, I stumbled upon his collection of sci-fi books from the 1950s and 60s. Oh, wow. And he was all too willing, hey, yeah, read this. Um, I don't know if you would remember uh, books that you had one side and then you flip it over and it had a totally different book. They were two oh, books. Yeah. 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 But and, they were, they were opposite and you would read. And when you get to the middle of the book, you'd flip it and start from the other side. Yeah. Which was another sci-fi story. Yeah. Uh, those books, those stories awaken my imagination. So from then, you know, I'm saying, Hey, what's this, what that world looked like, what would this world look like? And, uh, Actually, in college, I started writing a novel. Well, yes, writing as well as researching. But school, I had to turn yeah. my attention to the books <laughs> in order to yeah. graduate and achieve the degrees. And the military, that took a lot, a lot of time. But my experience with them, I wanted in 2006, when I actually wrote the book while deployed in Iraq, it was really just Navy Marine Corps. I wanted to highlight the Navy Marine Corps team in a futuristic setting, you know, encountering first contact with the aliens. But then after getting back and doing all my other duties and multiple rotation Marine yeah. sailors to Iraq, I stayed in Camp Pendleton, but I had to do a lot of work with my team to get these guys out the door. Uh, I didn't finish it till 2021, and by then Space Force was created, and I had at that point been with three different joint commands in NATO, so I went through and re, in essence rewrote the book to include all the services, to include Space Force, and this, unlike what it is right now, I've elevated Space Force higher than what it currently is. Uh, I make the statement, we created Space Force on the cheap and stuck it underneath the umbrella of the Air Force without really considering what is Space Force, its missions, its objectives, what do we really want to do? Because right now, they're concerned about a bit of cybersecurity and satellites. And yet, China and Russia have declared by 2035 they want to put a nuclear power plant on the moon. We're going to see our conflicts of Earth just expand beyond our atmosphere. Yep. And Space Force is not ready for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I, I was going through the first couple chapters of your book and... Um, as one of the cats decides to start yelling at me, but I was going through uh, the first couple chapters and my impressions at first were that this seems to be very like geared toward military or military and through, you know, an enthusiast type of crowd. Cause it is very detailed, like your explanation of ranking and vice admiral and, you know, you even gave a shout out to having some Rangers on the, on one of the ships. And, you know, um, I thought that was really cool. And, uh, but what would you say, who would you say is your, your main target audience for this book? Could just, uh, somebody with zero military experience, pick it up and enjoy it, you think, or do you, should you have a little bit of a background? I so when I was writing it in general, uh, the way I was looking at it is camps, definitely the military group, uh, those uh, who ha have served or are serving. So 
you know, hey, here's a way we can serve in space and first contact. Then the general population for just enjoyment. Uh, but then, um, and I never was a uh, uh, a recruiter, and I would have failed as a recruiter. Uh, I'm too blunt. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> I wanted people in like high school and maybe college to be able to pick it up and get a sense, hey, I, I can do this. Uh, there's a, a place for me and uh, let's join uh, the Navy or the Air Force or Space Force. I mean, I don't knock any of the services because all of the services have a place in our military. They have a role and it's very important. Mm -hmm. you know, I have our conflicts and all that, but really everything each service does, they have a role and a purpose. And I would like people to be able to say, I would like to join the military or uh, become a scientist. I mean, I do have some flavoring of science in here, even though it's soft science is yes, I'm not a scientist or even join the diplomatic corps. You know, foreign relations. Mm -hmm. If you notice, I even bring in the diplomat. Is the admiral noticed there were very little scientists and no diplomats, and he's going out for first contact. Right. So I need a diplomatic corps on my staff. <laughs> right. The previous guy that got got replaced by the the new vice admiral. Uh, decided to go more uh, heavy on the military than on diplomatic corps or science corps, which just does not make sense. And I can understand why the the president wanted him off that mission at that point, because you got to be able to do all three. You do. And uh, I, I can, being that I've worked around State Department and interacted with State Department, yeah. there is uh and it was not always like this. We were more of a partnership in our history. But quite frankly, it gets really nasty to try and work with State Department if you're military. Uh, and come to find out, uh, there's some real disgruntlement in State Department towards the military over, uh, I believe it was Haiti several years ago. And I guess the military was a little too heavy handed. Hmm. So the last time I had to deal with state dealing with missions, state was really heavy handed. And what I was finding out about the politics in D.C. between uh, DHS, HHS and State Department, the military is like, good thing I was in Germany working the problems and not in D.C. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it was ugly from what I understand. <laughs> well, um, I want to jump to kind of modern day stuff here for a moment because Nane brings up a great question. I might as well start thinking about uh, bringing these questions up and then we'll dig more into your book. He says, how does the Navy, Army, etc. treat the subject of UAPs in your opinion? So considering all the stuff that's happened since the 2017 like breaking of the tic tac, the go fast, and the gimbal things turned over by, you know, uh, I guess it was Christopher Mellon in the State Department, and that he got off of, you know, Commander Fravor's uh, flight, his squadron that was chasing down that tic tac and things. What is your your thoughts on all of that? So. My representative, Tim Burchette, he sits on the UAP committees. Yeah. And when, when I heard it, I'm like, are you wasting our time and our resources and tax dollars? And he finally came out and said, he's trying to figure out the trans or make transparent where the money is going. Mm -hmm. What's going on with all the taxpayers' money? I'm like, okay, I can buy that line is um, for us, it, when I was active and we talked about it, it was speculation and more of 
a sidebar enjoyment type subject. Uh, I've never spoken to any uh, naval aviators or Air Force pilots that have come across sightings and that have been going to Congress and talked to them about it. Um, yeah, for us, it was more speculation or fun, but quite frankly, we got caught up in what we were trying to do in real world operations. Okay. Even when I was at strategic command, uh, we weren't uh, really looking at UAPs. We were concerned about the solar system. Uh, we were actually monitoring, they probably still do monitor the sun and solar uh, uh, events. Uh, they monitor satellites and what's going on with those. Yes, U.S. Strategic Command is a global functional combatant command. So they have to look at everything around the world as well as the magnetic field and beyond that. So uh, I was never in a discussion about UAPs. And if anything, you would think, oh, you're at the one command that's aiming satellites as well right. as natural, geospatial. You might come across that. <laughs> Uh, everything we were dealing with at that time, we were taking Libya down. So we became very concerned about uh, mustard gas precursors and what was going on with that. But yeah, um, it's nice. Would I like to actually see declassified documents come out, properly declassified documents, saying one way or the other? or um, I really am in favor of our congressional body really tracking, knowing where we're sending our money and what we're doing with it. Yeah. Uh, what needs to remain classified to keep our um, opponents, uh, those who want to do us harm, yeah, we need to keep that classified so uh, China or Russia or Iran or North Korea doesn't suddenly get their hands on it. Because if we do have technology, we don't want to let that fall into hands that could actually use it against us or other nations. You know, assuming we're good caretakers and right. <laughs> don't do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the, we've had um, Stephen Bassett on like four times on our show now, and he's a big proponent of disclosure and uh, you know, ending the truth embargo when it comes to UFOs and things like that. And then recently, you know, arrow came out with the report that basically says we're all crazy again. <laughs> <laughs> and there is no evidence of aliens. There's no evidence of reverse engineering. And basically, uh, um, how did, how did they put it? It was basically a, he said, sh she said type of thing. And, uh, it just got talked to, to the wrong people and people took it seriously when it really wasn't. So, you know, so it's like, uh, like my wife and I, I mean, we, we two 30 in the morning, we saw a gigantic triangular black triangular aircraft mm -hmm. or some type of craft hovering over the road at an intersection that we were going to, to be on the expressway. And this thing was massive. It had to be 300 feet on a side, a light in each corner. Um, Christopher Mellon actually contacted us. He heard our story on Micah Hanks program and was interested and sent us actually a Navy guy's account and drawings and asked us, you know, can you compare? Does this match what this guy had said? And it pretty much did. So, you know, we've been, that's what brought us into this whole kind of topic in the first place was running into this craft and seeing this thing. And I've got a back, my dad's a, a United pilot, you know, he's, he retired. Um, I've been around aircraft. I got pictures of me and a baby, you know, as a baby with, you know, the, the Clark headsets on, you know, sitting in my dad's Piper Cherokee and I've gotten my, um, you know, I got my solo license and stuff like that when I was younger and, 
And I know aircraft. I used to go out to the Air National Guard base all the time, every air show, all of this stuff. This thing hovering over the ground with these lights coming out of these corners was not a military aircraft. It, it, well, at least it wasn't ours. There's no way that you would want to break every FAA. I mean, it was maybe 15 miles north of Detroit Metro, mm -hmm. a busy airport at 2.30 in the morning. And we have this huge craft that's floating, you know, right there above the, the expressway. And it turns as we got on the expressway and I'm gunning it because I need to get out of there. <laughs> and the thing turns and it starts moving parallel to us. So, and then disappeared. One of the items, and I never tried for a pilot program because um, I figured out I had to wear glasses. I don't have yeah. anywhere near 2020 vision. But I used to watch uh, high school. Uh, there was a program, I forget what channel. Uh, about flight, the discovery of flight and the evolution from prop planes to uh, jet planes, uh, and especially some of the planes they were developing for Vietnam. And in there, Lockheed Martin was, I think, the leading developer of flight. And they had started working, I want to say in the 60s, on stealth technology that eventually led to the Blackbird and then our stealth bombers and fighters. Mm -hmm. And at one point, they actually uh, showed where they had the flying wing. They had developed the flying wing. They were actually working on flying saucers at that time, back in the 60s even. And they were having a lot of difficulty with that. And in the uh, 1980s, doing some of my research at the university, I came across programs requiring uh, chips and all that for what is now today the F-22. I and mean, we've been working on that plane since like the 70s, really, and not having the technology to do what everything that thing can do today. I mean, fifth generation fighters you saw in the movie Top Gun Maverick. Yeah. You know, yep. Suddenly that thing just kind of goes sideways, flips around, and it's totally <laughs> a beautiful maneuver of a fifth generation fighter. But that's technology that started way back in the 60s. What if, and I believe heavily in human ingenuity more than I believe about. Uh, we got our hands on alien technology. I think we have what it takes, uh, or our generation up to now has had what it takes that we could develop that type of technology, that type of flight. Um, but do we want to let our people know we have that technology? Do we want to know let uh, not competitors, but adversaries know we have that technology? Uh, and what what is the practical application, be it for general flight for passengers or for military? Uh, so I would throw it out there as misdirection or misinformation to say, yeah, I'm testing it. I'm doing everything I need to to test it. But if I get sighted, I got to make myself appear as if I'm not of human origin. Uh, and I guess I fall more into that camp. I probably a bit paranoid of our federal government <laughs> than maybe a lot of other people, but I would think we're probably hiding stuff from ourselves. Uh, if we are in contact with an alien species, uh, I think it would be more along like the scenario I wrote in uh, SCSG Explorer where we come across a message from deep space that has specs in it for technology. Uh, I would think they would, an alien intelligence that wants to interact, wouldn't give us tech, but teach us the physics, the mathematics. Uh, because um, 
I mean, I'm a big Second Amendment dude, but the last thing I'm going to do is hand a real pistol, be it loaded or unloaded, to a five-year-old child. Right. I'm going to first teach the child about safety and respect of uh, other people's property, teach them respect towards tools in general, and then start teaching them weapon safety before they ever even get to touch it. And then I'm going to teach them how to safely handle the weapon before I load it. <laughs> and yeah. then teach them how to actually shoot it safely. You know, uh, why would an alien species dump tech onto us? And if they're visiting, this is an odd way to do anything with uh, somebody else. I just appear high and run away. What am I now trying to do? What's my motive? What's my objective? And I would be extremely suspicious of any alien intelligence that does that. You know, are you showing off? You're showing you're better than us? Well, now you're presenting yourself as a threat. So if I go back to the training and military planning, I'm now doing a threat assessment, a risk assessment, and what do I need to do to counter that? In which case, I'm going to step up my sciences, my research, my development, uh, start building technology, and I'm going to start testing that because now I have superior tech up here, show itself off, and then go away. You're presenting a threat to me. You know, do I immediately try to talk to you? Well, we did. We sent out a big record out with you know, directions even to the planet. Know, right? <laughs> <I'm> like, no, <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't do tell that. Them where we're at. <laughs> Let's go meet them. <laughs> well, as far as I'm concerned, somebody has found us, and I, I mean, I guess you know. Have you ever? I mean, this is one of my questions. I might as well just pose it now. Have you ever seen a UAP or a UFO? What you would consider something like? out of this world or didn't make sense in your military career? Uh, well, me personally, no, I uh, never encountered um, a aircraft or ground craft or uh, anything like that. Uh, my experience uh, is more, one could argue interdimensional, but had nothing to do with the military. So, okay, interdimensional. What do you what do you mean by that? Um, well, so with more of my background um, and listening to astrophysicists and physicists, theoretical, they've identified eleven different dimensions. And just the other day, I heard there's twelve. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Eleven is bad enough. <laughs> right. Let's just throw on one more. <laughs> but uh, I believe there are interdimensional beings. And I think we're more than a three-dimensional being. I, I think we come literally from the 11th dimension if what I've heard scientists and physicists describe the 11th dimension. I believe we're actually from the 11th dimension. We just live in a three-dimensional body that can only travel one way along the time dimension. And with that thinking, yeah, I'd say I've encountered some other interdimensional beings um, along my lifeline. So uh, that, can, that's... Can you ex like expand on that a little bit? Like, like what kind of beings? What was that like? Well, I mean, I'm Judeo-Christian is my faith base. Okay. And yeah, I mean, I've asked to see uh, my guardian angel. And while I didn't get to see him, I got the perception of him uh, very clearly presented that, yes, I'm here in the room with you. And that was a pretty dynamic uh, feeling and and uh, perception that yes another person intelligent being was in the room with me 
So, and yeah, uh, I can tell the difference between a creature of good and light versus dark and evil. So uh, that okay. was definitely a good experience. <laughs> but um, do I hope there's intelligent alien life forms out there? Yeah, I think it'd be exciting. Uh, I wonder if we're mature enough as a species that we can even come to equitable arrangements with our own countries. And uh, who, if I was coming to this planet, who would I deal with? You know, what country would I say is uh, at the right stage of development for me to engage with? Uh, and flying around a uh, uh, different uh, vehicles to make us question things is a form of communication, maybe, but I don't think we're getting it if that's the intent is a communication. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so we just recently had on Nathaniel Gillis and I saw him in chat. I don't know if he's still watching or not. And he's a, uh, he he considers himself a religious demonologist and by that what he does is he goes through records of antiqu uh, antiquity oh my god i can't speak now but he goes through ancient records and um looks for like abduction encounters and what people wrote about saying that they were kidnapped by the fae or uh had incubus or succubus attacks or were impregnated by something any he, he makes close correlations to the spiritual realm and i'm wondering if you guys are kind of on that kind of on that same level that it, that what we're what we might be seeing are these interdimensional beings kind of playing with us from these other realms and they kind of peek their heads in and mess around you know i, I mean I, because I, he's got like a very dark, there's like a very dark, sinister agenda kind of being worked in the background. And then in the end of April, we've got on, um, uh, what's his name? His last name's Mylar. He's a command sergeant major that retired from the Air Force and worked for Space Force. But he's a, a, a Christian and he's written many novels about the antichrist ufos aliens and how they're connected as well and i find this very fascinating um because from my standpoint and from michelle's standpoint you know what we saw was a physical craft period no that was it 2 30 in the morning somebody's messing with us i had a message in my head that said get away from here you don't belong here get away and then a couple months later i ended up with Graves disease because my thyroid was turned on, you know, hyperthyroidism after this encounter and all my hair turned white and fell out and all of this stuff. And I, I, I keep on coming back to this. It seems like there's a, I don't want to say religious. I want to say interdimensional spiritual connection that was written about thousands of years ago in our religious texts that talk about these same kind of things that have happened. So what's your take on that? And I just threw a whole bunch at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, okay. And being Judeo Christian, looking at the old Testament, the new Testament, uh, looking at some other texts, I, I don't dive too deeply into it because I want to keep, uh, my walk, what my walk is, but we do know in the Old Testament where there's some really fantastic interactions between us as a species and, in this case, God, and the way he's uh, revealed himself in his heavenly hosts. And that's seen in several of the prophet uh, books, you know, and Moses had his encounters. Uh, I've had my own encounters. So, yeah, I, I definitely believe we interact with spiritual beings. And we being a spiritual being, 
we're going to be able to interact with them. And even my dogs uh, can pick up a spiritual being when it starts to reveal itself. So even uh, the animal kingdom can pick it up. Do they, can they imitate uh, the dark side, the dark beings, demonic spirits, imitate tech? Probably. And we're told that Satan himself can imitate an angel of light. And you have to really be sensitive with God to know when you have somebody who's imitating. So, yeah, I think those are real and can happen. I think uh, we develop our own technology as people, and we can be God-inspired or even demonic-inspired on that tech. Uh, your encounter... I would not put into a spiritual encounter or even an alien. I would think you probably came across uh, a human experiment and our tech was such, I mean, and again, not being a rad health person or into the physics of radiation, but the thyroid and the hair loss, uh, Graves disease sounds like a radiation exposure to me. You know, and I had to refer then to the experts in those fields, say, hey, does this sound like a form of radiation and what type of radiation? And that uh, can lead to uh, what type of technology is being used. Uh, I like the subliminal uh, message saying you need to move away from here. Yes, you were probably near a test site then <laughs> at that time. And they just want you out and leave so they could continue with their testing. That would be what I would say is a very real human encounter. Uh, is it possible? Of course, it's possible that an alien craft has made the journey here. But why and how do they get here? I mean, we can't even work out the physics on how to get outside of our solar system or even to the moon without liquid propellants, even though we were starting to work down a nuclear propulsion system. But then we all signed a treaty saying we won't use nukes in outer space. Uh, we probably ought to clarify that treaty is we need nuclear propulsion, especially fusion, to get to our uh, other planets, let alone outside of our system. Um, how do you generate a gravity wave? How do you uh, generate uh, faster than light travel and not uh, slow down your aging while everybody else super ages? You know, those are mysteries that we're not even yet at. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm not trying to discredit your experience because that's your experience. Uh, my rationality would say we have developed a form of technology of flight uh, that's not totally safe. <laughs> I mean, if you're having side effects from the encounter, that's not a safe tech. And who knows what the operator inside the craft is experiencing. You know, uh, are they properly shielded or are they just being exposed to it? And we're uh, like the dive tables. We made Navy divers actually hurt themselves to figure out dive tables. How far can you go right. down? What's the mixture? I mean, while we talk safety, we'll break safety rules for our yeah. jet. <laughs> yeah. when my when my dad was in the army he was part of an experiment that they were testing because he was a helicopter pilot in vietnam he was a door gunner and a crew chief and was a pilot when he went in but he was you know taking care of the helicopters and flying missions and shooting out the the door gun of a huey and all that stuff and he did some flying but not that much until he got out of vietnam but one of the things that he did was he was in an experiment to test uh, ejection seats. He would he would be one of the guys riding on the sled, and they would shoot him down the 
the right. track <laughs> and see what kind of physical, you know, things would happen to him. And he said, you know, if anything, it was better than dealing with my mother. So, <laughs> so that tells you how the household was back then. <laughs> well, and it, that's kind of funny. We can't do that with uh, your general population. So we actually started doing that with pigs because of their chest cavity, the way they were. We would do that with uh, car crashes until we came up with the crash dummy. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I, I can see that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty funny, but I, apparently he even has some, some uh, old, what were they, 8 millimeter reels that he has from... And he told me when he passes away, he wants me to donate them to like the National History Museum and things like that of Vietnam and flying over the jungle and their missions and stuff that they did. But he also has him on the rocket sleds simulating the ejection and and all that stuff. So, um, yeah. So, you know, speaking of aliens, <laughs> nice segue. Who are the alien? I already kind of know this, but for our audience and people that will listen all around the world, when I release this podcast, who are the <laughs> aliens that we are in contact with in your book? And what is their motivation for contact? How much you want to get into? I guess I well, should. Uh, the main alien, uh, pardon. The main alien is. Uh, from a planet called Camorica, and they are the Camorricans, and they're the ones that sent out a general broadcast. Uh, their intent and what uh, is discovered when we pick it up are gaps or holes in the technology uh, that they supplied in their message. And what that what we figure as uh, the United States, because it was the U.S. that picked it up and they immediately classified it and hid it from the world. Uh, they determine, well, if there are gaps in technology like hyperspace and even in medicine, there were gaps in that. That caused us to become paranoid, say maybe they're not good actors after all, but we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. And that's why the fleet's put together to go and make first contact. Uh, our own science had developed enough of hyperspace theory that really, by happenstance, what was in the message filled our gaps. And so we could build our own drive and therefore be able to go out and meet them. Uh, that's uh, the primary uh, species. And by the way, SESG Explorer is actually the first in a trilogy. Uh, I have Minerva written. It's currently at the Department of Defense for their approval. And in the, that book, we're going to meet, uh, well, in Explorer, we meet the Alia. Uh, we come across them and we learn a lot more about the Caborgans from that creature and what their uh, tactics and strategy is. Um, in Minerva, we meet the Aliens again, plus the, uh, I have trouble even pronouncing the names <laughs> of the creatures. <laughs> That's when you know uh, it's a true sci-fi book. We come across, well, sure, I didn't write down the Wuxula name, but we got the Gop. Actually, I did. There they are. Uh, we come across the Gluba, the Wusuna, uh, and we actually become very friendly with the Wusuna. They start helping us a lot uh, because we figure out the Camorricans are bad actors. Their intent is to conquer worlds. Uh, and that's why Explorer uh, actually becomes a fight for survival for the Admiral and his fleet once they figured out what was going on on Camorica. And it, it's interesting. I chose the name SESG based off of what we did in the Navy and Marine Corps. 
we have new orgs, Marine Expeditionary Units, on board Amphibious Readiness Group. Well, we started adding uh, destroyers and even a submarine to give them firepower, naval firepower, I should say. And we call that Expeditionary Strike Group. So this is Space Expeditionary Strike Group. So we very heavy military still, but that that was mainly for self-defense because they do encounter pirates along the way and have to fight off. Uh, actually, uh, in one chapter, they get into a pretty nifty space battle, which they didn't want to do, <laughs> but they got suckered into it and suddenly they're in a fight for their life. And you'll see how they do their maneuvering in order to get out of that. Uh, and it's why it was a fleet of warships with a diplomatic mission because we just didn't know what was out there. We're a paranoid species. So that that's <laughs> why they're a, a, a strike group, not just a diplomatic mission. But uh, there's so many variety. I didn't describe all the creatures they encounter because the humans that encountered them were overwhelmed by what they saw. But there is a description of a, a one creature that we explore a little bit more in Minerva. And then, like I said, Minerva, we are introduced to other alien species. Uh, but they're all pretty much victims of Camorga and what the Camorgans have done to them. So <laughs> now a question for you on, on is it the Camorgan? Is that how you pronounce that? Yeah, actually it is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, is there something from your military experience or uh, something from your previous readings, maybe as a child or, or, or some kind of experience you've had that, that you are basing, I mean, obviously your military experience and stuff, but is there something you're working out in this book from your past and past experiences that you're bringing forward into a sci-fi like do you have certain goals that you would like to see humanity get through and and uh you know those kind of things like what is your deep-rooted motivation for writing such a and just from what i've read so far a very very detailed military you know space military book with diplomacy and stuff as well. And you make that a, a point in the first chapter that the new vice admiral is like, where's the diplomatic corps? Well, we didn't, the previous guy didn't want that. So, you know, and he's wait, wait, wait. <laughs> right. So obviously I'm thinking you've got something deep rooted in your, uh, your roots of diplomacy and, and working that out previous experience, something you've seen that, you know, you wish we could have done better diplomacy here in the real world. How is this all acting out? The and there's of, a lot, there's a lot for <laughs> you. <there. laughs> uh, well, how many times is uh, a kid, do we face a group of kids that just want to hurt you? And you're outnumbered. So either you're a real badass fighter or uh, you're skinny and you can fight to take care of yourself. But one on one, okay. But two, three on one, you better be able to think your way out of a problem. And sometimes that's talking. Sometimes it's bluffing. Um, yeah, there were three of us uh, sailors. This was at Seven Fleet. We were walking down the street in South Korea. Sunrise had just come up. And being sailors, we were sailors. Uh, but we came across three Russian merchant marines, big guys, huge. And I'm in front of my two mates. And next thing I know, one guy just shoulders me. You know, he's being typical Russian. It's throwdown time. But some way, somehow, a look I gave him, 
just caused him to, yeah, let's go on. And, and I've been told I do get that appearance where uh, a berserker is going to come out, not bragging on myself. It's just I've had a Marine friend tell me, man, they look at you and you're just crazy looking to them. <laughs> like, hey, it keeps me out of a fight. I'm good with that. <laughs> right, right. But you look at where we're at today. How many conflicts are we in? Uh, why are we shooting at each other? And we have reasons. There are real reasons. But where's our diplomacy? Ever since we left Iran, uh, after they took our embassy, we've never established an embassy back with Iran. Not saying they're good actors. Actually, they're very bad actors, in my opinion. They want our downfall. But we're not even talking to them, diplomat to diplomat. And uh, I think it's in Clausewitz, the statement, war is too important to be left up to the generals. Because war is just imposing your will upon somebody else with violence and extreme yeah. violence. Well, if you're at war to make somebody do what you want them to do, you need somebody to go and tell them what is it that you want them to do. <laughs> if you're not talking to them, you're going to just end up destroying each other's civilization, total war. Is uh, it the same with the North Koreans as well? Do Or do we have at least some kind of diplomatic channels with them? I know when Trump was in office, he was trying to calm down that situation and he seemed to do okay, but are we well, still on no talking terms with North Korea now as well? Well, understand with North Korea, people say Afghanistan is America's longest war. That's not true. We are to this day at war with North Korea. And if you read my bio, you know, I was with U S forces, Korea in South Korea. And that was at the time that the, South Korean uh, ship was sunk by a, a unknown torpedo. Uh, but yeah, we're at war to this day with Korea. We're just in a ceasefire. The armistice that was established in 53 is still going on. That means we're at war. And the only dipl diplomacy is right there at the uh, demilitarized zone where there's a UN building that straddles both North and South Korea. And when uh, we go into that building and the North Koreans go into the building, there's a table with a line literally across it. Half the table's on their side, half is on South Korea's side. That's the only real diplomacy we have. Otherwise, we go through China to talk to North Korea. And that was the standard for... Um, I guess ever since the armistice was created until Trump came along, he broke the standard and yeah. said, no, forget this five or six nation thing where we all talk together to North Korea. I'm going to talk directly to the leader of North Korea. And actually uh, that was a big out of the box thinking that had what appeared to be positive results. And now we're back to not even talking to them. We're not even using China or Russia to talk to them. And the guy's on the loose again. He's not contained. So, um, yeah, I want to drive home. If you can come to a nonviolent resolution, because when we unleash the military, really unleash the military, it's going to be all hell is breaking loose and we'll win. I'm confident even today the U S will win, but to what extent are we ready to go? And I think we, when um, in SESG Explorer, I show you how far we're willing to go when diplomacy fails and be it our fault, your fault, nobody's fault, to use a movie line. <laughs> what movie is that from? <laughs> oh, a John Wayne movie, uh, Big Jake. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to unleash hell. 
<laughs> and to use Shakespeare, the dogs of war will be released. Yeah. You know, we cry havoc backwards that. <laughs> yeah. Cry havoc yeah. and <laughs> release the dogs of war. Yeah. yeah. And really, the we're being humans and the fact that all humans are really warlike. We may deny it. We may strive for peace, but we're confrontational. We're hostile. Catch us on a bad day. You'll really see how uh, hostile we are. The better side is to take a breath. Let's talk our way through this. Come to an arrangement, be it we both lose. There's a good compromise. Everybody loses. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, just what we were talking about earlier at the start of the show, you know, if you if you marry the, you know, if we can't d get diplomacy right and we have 77 percent of the youth today that can't qualify for the military. I'm kind of concerned that we might try to unleash war or hell, but we're not going to do all that great if we're not, you know, have the people filling the positions and then, you know, is that where we're going to get AI involved and, you know, a lot of remote drones and things starting to take the place of, you know, boots on the ground. And I can't see that working out very well. So, uh, old saying, um, well, no, what is the old saying? Navy wins the battles, but, uh, the army wins the war, something like that. So, yeah. Cause you um, always need boots on the ground. If you want to, if you want to win, you have to occupy and take them down and show them. So AI is not going to work in that. And if you look at what's going on in the Ukraine, you know, Ukraine, the government of Ukraine has been able to reclaim land and territory because they push Russian troops off. Uh, and they've had massive casualties, but they ever get themselves back together and they steamroll, then they're going to take land. And when you have occupied territory and there's no real resistance, you won the war. Like Iraq. We won the war in Iraq. Uh, then we denied, I, this is my opinion, not government saying, uh, we denied saying, oh, we're, we're not here to occupy. We're just here to help you. We had how many Marines and soldiers occupied with Navy and Air Force across all of Iraq. We were occupying. And we were not at war, technically. We won the war. We defeated Saddam Hussein and his military. Mm -hmm. Then we went to counterinsurgency and all that, which one can argue is war, but that's yeah. a different war. That's not the war we went to Iraq. And we won that one. But we were still there with troops, and we're still there today with soldiers and uh, I'm not sure we have Marines, but we have soldiers on the ground in Iraq. They keep getting shot at. <laughs> yeah. So uh, whether or not we want to admit it, somebody is warring against us, uh, be it Iran, be it their terrorist groups. But we're in a different war, but we're denying that we're in war, even though our people are being shot at constantly. Sorry. Isn't that true? That, you know, I had a friend, uh, we went in the, when we went into the military, we went in kind of together and he went into intelligence and I went infantry being, so we know who the intelligent one was in that <laughs> situation. Even though I scored very high on the ASFAB test, I had delusions of grandeur. I was going to get into the Rangers and all oh. that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to wear the beret and all that. And now I think back and go, man, that was just stupid. Um, but you know, but nice. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was in South Korea and, uh, he said that daily that there would be shots from North Korea to our guys patrolling the DMZ. I mean, we at each other all the yeah. time. It, when the media finally picks it up, it's like, Oh my God, shots rang. Right. That's a common occurrence. 
the infantrymen on the DMC, they look at each other. They see the North Korean soldiers. Uh, I've heard stories how real it is, I don't know, where two of them will stumble across each other, look around, and might exchange some stuff. But yeah, in general, we shoot each other when, or shoot at each other. When I right. went to the EMC for a trip, uh, we used to wear our uniforms, but the rule became no uniforms whatsoever when we visited the DMC. And I went to the UN building and looked at it. But we stand out in public looking at the North Korean side in their building, and they have people taking our pictures. Yeah. I mean, my photograph is in North Korea and probably Chinese intelligence headquarters somewhere. So, but I went and visited the DMC. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. The soldiers, uh, if you ever see pictures of the North Koreans and South Korean soldiers, uh, they, what's the type of fighting? Jiu Jitsu, is it? The South yeah. Korean soldiers are in a fighting stance. You know, they wear sunglasses, the uh, helmet, but they're staying there in a fighting stance uh, facing the North Koreans who are in their uniform doing the same thing because we're still at war with each other and they know it. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, before we start to wrap this up, there was, uh, there's a very smart guy. His name was Eric Weinstein, or that is his name. I don't I've know. Heard- are you from- you familiar with him? I actually listened to a three-hour podcast they did with. Uh, I want to say the gentleman's name is Williams. I don't. Yeah, but, Chris. Chris William. Yeah. Williamson. Yeah, Chris Williamson. Yeah, and and he said something very interesting because I'm I'm a big fan of of Chris's uh, podcast, and he said something very interesting, like how complacent we've become as a species. And he thinks it would probably be a good idea to start nuclear like bomb detonations again. So everybody can kind of see what would happen on this planet. If we decided to go full on nuke war, you know, that like we've lost touch of that fear of, you know, don't talk smack to your mom because your dad's going to come in the room and beat the crap out of you for talking crap to your mom. And my we, mom would beat the crap out of me. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> Dad was like, you're stupid. He runs away. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You deal with your mother. I'm out of here. <laughs> But, you know, what do you, what is your thought? I mean, we see these conflicts and a lot of people are saying we're already at in World War Three. We just haven't officially, you know, we're, we're as somebody here said in, in chat, you know, isn't NATO in the U.S. basically using Ukraine as a proxy for a war with Russia? Now, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the in the background as to why Russia's pulling the stuff that it's doing. And it comes to that failed diplomacy thing. I think you were talking about during the Obama and uh, Clinton eras of, you know, we were fine, not trying to get Ukraine to join NATO and Russia was fine with that. They wanted that buffer zone. And then we started trying to pull Ukraine into NATO and that pissed off the Russians. Yeah. And, I mean, so, there's a lot to it, and I, I'm probably simplifying it way too much. But anyways, what are yeah, your thoughts on that? Yes, to uh, yes, a consequential question to a diplomacy question, and one with alliances. And it's funny you ask the question because today, driving home, I was uh, saying to my wife, we don't understand radiation anymore in this country. Yes, we have the physicists. We have the people at the national labs who work it. We have the people in the nuclear plants that work it. We have the submarines, the aircraft carriers. But that's not the general public. That's not the general population. So when Fukushima went off, 
everybody freaked out and bought anything that had the word iodine in it without realizing how ineffective that was and what iodine is made for. Iodine is only for one thing, and this the thyroid in the body. That's it. But the radiation that comes out of a nuclear power plant, it does more than that. You know? Yeah. It affects we, all your cells and your DNA. Right. And we listen to the Marvel Universe and the Hulk talk gamma radiation. <laughs> oh, give me some of that so I can be big and green without understanding what we're really talking about. And that I think we have lost in this society that we don't understand radiation and what that really is and how dangerous it is. You go and get an x-ray, they put the little lead sheet on you. Big deal. So what? I'm getting such a minor dose. Right. But, you know, Madame Curie used to walk around with an isotope in her body and she died from it, you know, from the exposure. She didn't know. She just thought it was great. Close her hand. Look at it. You can see through my hand. But we are at that level of ignorance, in my opinion, again. Um. And that's, uh, there was a made for TV movie about uh, the Manhattan Project that they had accidental release inside a building and they closed it. And one of the physicists went right to the board, did the math, and said, All but you have been exposed. You get out of here and get us help. And they died of organ failure within days from that exposure. Uh, so yeah, so it's kind of to like Eric's point about, you know, we, we are, we don't know the, the trouble that we can cause and we should be very afraid of it. And you start, uh, trading nukes, even on a low yield level, you're going to have some massive fallout and effects. Um, we were concerned using nuclear weapons during the hot portion of our war with North Korea. And Eisenhower is saying there as president trying to say, uh, or, well, he, he was confronted. He needed to make a decision, use nukes or not. And he's like, where? On whom? Mm -hmm. What's the military target? Because when you drop a nuke, you're not killing a military target. You're killing civilians all over, and it's indiscriminate. If you think carpet bombing in World War II is bad, start dropping nukes and watch how bad it gets. We, when I was in uh, middle school, sixth, seventh, seventh grade, I think it is, we were still in the middle of the Cold War, and we had a film where they dropped a 10 megaton nuke on a city. And they show the rings and what you do. I mean, you're obliterated right off the bat. Then you're just fried and dead. Then you have the dead where the cure was or the help you would get. A doctor would come along, along with the Colt 45 and just put a round in your brain. Because there was nothing to do for you in your suffering. Then they started to look at, can I give you medical care? Yeah, you know, that was obviously, I still remember that. That made yeah. such an impression. That's the effects of nuclear. Do we teach children that? And therefore, maybe the violent way isn't the first way. And I think it was Asimov who wrote, violence is the last tool of the incompetent. Uh, another reason why I tried to look for diplomatic solutions by just going for war and don't think I'm a pacifist. I'll use the military at heartbeat. <laughs> right. But I'm going to be very clear about why I'm using the military, what my objective is, and how far we will go. Yeah. yeah. Diplomacy by other means at that point. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, yeah. I will hit you over the head till you start listening and then right. it's like all right now let's go back to talk <laughs> it's like the old saying it's like the old saying the beatings will continue until morale improves <laughs> but what was your that was the consequential question your other yeah. one 
the diplomacy, oh, Ukraine and what's going on in Russia. Why not? Russia or Putin was taking a book out of Gerald, or not Gerald, Al Bismarck's uh, playbook. Uh, Germany used not to be a unified country uh, until the late 1800s and early 1900s. And a uh, man named Bismarck, behind the first uh, Emperor Wilhelm Kaiser, uh, was the one that started unifying the country through what's called limited wars. He would go fight France, get to a point, and then end the war. And he would do that, and he would increase Germany's holding until he could unify it into a country. I think Putin was doing that with Ukraine. Mm. His stated uh, goal was reestablish the Soviet Union empire. And to do that, without getting NATO and a massive force to attack him, he would take a little bit at a time. He retook Georgia. He took the Crimea. He took parts of Eastern Europe or Ukraine, and say, oh, I'm only doing what the people want me to do. They're inviting me in. So he had his justification. He took a little bit of time. The West would yell and scream and stomp our feet, but do what? Nothing. You know, Trump comes along and throws down all these sanctions on him and Iran, and suddenly you see a cease of behavior. Mm-hmm. And our press said, well, you can take a little bit of Ukraine. What does he do? I have a weak Western leadership. They will do nothing. I'm rolling in. Yeah. And now what's the drain on our treasury? And I thought I heard one of our uh, military members may have been killed in Ukraine over a strike recently. Oh, boy. You know, if, if we're actually in whenever I hear, oh, we're not putting any trainers or anybody inside Ukraine, even though the president did slip and say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Why do you think we have special forces and what's their role? Yeah. What what exactly do those guys do? I mean, so, geez. And now contractors as well. And there's, yeah. there's retired guys that I know that have, that have gone over there. To do just that. Yeah. To go train the, the militia forces and stuff and help get people out. So it, it's it's really bizarre. It's so are we in World War Three already? We just haven't gone fully hot yet. Uh well, are we in another Cold War? Uh we're in the beginnings uh of a new Cold War, I would say. Uh, I would think, but this time, well, even when we started the Cold War right after World War II, we didn't know at the end of 1945, we were actually in a new war. Yeah. Uh, we became aware of it in our government in 1947, developed a, a total uh, whole of government strategy to defeat the Soviet Union. And we maintain that entire strategy and plan all the way up to Ronald Reagan. When he was briefed on it, his statement is, well, let's accelerate it. Let's bring them down now. But he didn't have the foresight, uh, in my opinion, of, uh, and FDR isn't my favorite president, but Roosevelt and Eisenhower, uh, Truman and Churchill and those guys had the foresight to say, what do we want the world to be after we're done defeating Nazi Germany? We didn't have that foresight. We didn't develop a plan for the world after we defeated the Soviet Union. And I think that's the main reason why we're at where we're at. Uh, we have chaos throughout the world. And we now have a growing China, growing Russia, uh, they're now getting back together like they were under the Soviet Union and communist regimes uh, where they're a partnership. But this time it looks like China's in the lead. And yeah, we're already there and they're encroaching on territory. If you look at what's happening in the Philippine Sea. Oh, yeah. 
two islands, China's trying to truly make it the South Chinese China Sea. And if they lock that trade route down, they get a major, uh, they put their thumb on major artery of trade and can influence the world drastically by controlling the Strait of Malacca. And if they get farther down, they get two trade routes right there. Mm. And that's a big thing for, you know, the British Navy did it. The U.S. Navy has done it. It's called Freedom of Navigation, where we will sell warship through uh, what is considered international waters. And China is doing everything they can to say, no, what we call the South China Sea is territorial waters. So <laughs> that's a big yeah. legal difference from the U.N. standpoint. Uh, so, yeah, that's a Cold War. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, this conversation has been fascinating. We're at an hour and 35 minutes already. And I think we've covered all kinds of, all kinds of aspects to this book in, in diplomacy and war and your background. This has been a great conversation. So as we wrap this up, uh, do you have any speaking engagements or other appearances coming up that you want to let everybody know about? Uh, let's see. Well, there is, hang on. No, nope, wrong. I'm pulling up my other uh, item here. Uh, in July, we'll be at the Knoxville Convention Center doing Comic Con. Oh, cool. And where I'll actually be there selling books. Eek, where's, there's a printout somewhere over here with engagements uh i do know hey come here i'm sorry i didn't expect that question so i'm scrolling real quick <laughs> <laughs> well that's okay and while you're looking through that uh everybody once uh, again you can find a link to his book in the chat i've been linking it to the amazon page um you can find the link also in our show description and it's sesg explorer by christopher lorick so all right and my website christopherlorick.com uh, you get a little bit about my bio uh and the, where the book can be bought as well and in there uh, i keep a status about minerva so when uh dod gets back uh, I can say DOD review done, sending to publisher. Right. Uh, it looks like April 2nd, I'll be with uh, Podcast UFO, weekly live recorded uh, podcast and blog. Martin Willis. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's a big show. Oh, wow. And then April 3rd, David Watson. <laughs> So okay. Those are the next two on the calendar. Yeah, the UFO podcast. That's a big show. So you'll have a good exposure there. That's awesome. Sweet. Thank you. I've yeah. enjoyed this. Uh, one thing in SESG Explorer, I do throw out a moral issue because I do have a big moral issue with slavery in our world today. And yeah. I'm not talking the 1800s. Uh, I mean, today's what's really happening. Yes child yeah. slavery, the select slavery industry, yeah, all of that. Yep. And what's they stumble upon uh, actually comes right out of South Korea, what I've seen there. So, <laughs> yeah, big okay. issue still with, the, with slavery around the world today. And I bring that out in the book a little bit because, well, my wife, when she read, she goes, man, you hate slavery. Yeah, you think? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yep. No, I couldn't agree more. Um, all right. Well, Chris, this has been awesome. I really enjoyed this conversation. Michelle's been working the chat room over here. And uh yeah, it's been a great conversation. Now I get to put this all out on our our audio platforms, which will hit about 85 different countries. So <laughs> we got yeah, we got <laughs> listeners everywhere. So, all right. Well, Chris, I think I'm going to go ahead and say thank you. And 
we will catch when you get that second book out, come on back on and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. And by the way, just from what I've read so far, this smells like a sci-fi like mini series or like the beginning of a movie or something like that. It kind of reads like that. I don't know. Did you have that in mind? Not when I was writing it, but that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would love to see it on uh, the big screen or even the little screen. <laughs> yeah. Like a Netflix series or something along those lines, you know, just a good, like a good war slash diplomacy and outer space kind of a, a show. I think that would be really cool. Uh, all right <laughs> yep uh, all right chris well thank you very much and we will see you uh next time thank so you, thank you. <laughs> all right michelle that was a great great show what do you think um <clears throat> very interesting lots of information and then unfortunately i had to run in and out yeah the, cat, the room the cats, so much again the cats are just absolutely insane i can't believe it they are they are the demon spawn in this house. They get possessed as soon as we start a live show. Now, tomorrow when we do no show, they'll be sleeping. They'll just sleep. But Pretty they much. get excited when we get on the computers and start talking to people. So, all right, everybody. I think we're going to call it a night. Now, remember, the next two weekends, we will not have a show. So, uh, it'll be spring break. And Michelle and I have palm trees in our sights. So, and the desert and the desert. Yes, absolutely. So, okay, everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. It's been a great, interesting topics with kind of the stuff we don't usually get into here, but hopefully we'll get into it more. So good night, everybody. All right. Hey, Nane, thank you for joining us. You had a lot of great questions and uh, we'll get to them next time, hopefully. And Michelle, what do you got to say? Have a great week, everyone. Have a great week. We'll catch you in two weeks. And remember, keep your eyes to that sky.